Mom and Dad had a, a neighborhood store. Uh, I'd gone to law school, and I really hated law school. In fact, I hated school generally. And um, my dad said, "Why don't you just hang around the store for a few months before you, you know, begin your life?" And, and so I said, "Okay, what do you want?" And he said, "Well, if you hang around for a few months, you'll learn how to." open the store and close the store. It was a little neighborhood store. It was like 15 feet wide. But that's that was the source of their income. And I uh, said, OK. And he said, because after Christmas, he said, your mom and I would like to go on a vacation. And he said, you know, we've never had one. And I said, OK. He said, I've never asked you for anything, but I would trust you to open and close the store, take the money to the bank, you know, just do simple things. I said, OK. And they did take the week off in January, Columbus had a blizzard, and um, their, their vacation was driving from Columbus to Miami, spending three days in Miami and then driving back. So that was their, their big vacation after a lifetime. And uh, kind of happenstance, had a blizzard in Columbus, I went to the store, and it was like I don't know, 18 inches of snow, so there was no traffic. And I felt very obligated to be there because I was kind of guarding the fort. And there was just nothing to do. So, you know, you dust the floors, you, you know, you're, you're prepared, but obviously, no, there's gonna be no one's gonna come to the store. And I got bored, so I was just curious to see what categories of merchandise my dad and mom made money in. And I could sort out the invoices, and they kept track of sales by category of merchandise shirts and pants and skirts. And I would look through the invoices to see, and I figured out that in what my dad called sportswear, uh, they were making substantial profits. And in the big ticket items, then dresses and coats, they were making no money. And when he came back from their vacation, he sat down at a Woolworths coffee shop and I gave him the big ta-da. And he said, it's impossible. He says, we make money on the big ticket items. They said, no, you, you, you see them as big tickets, but you're taking big markdowns and there's no profitability. And from that, we got into a very classic father-son argument. So you know, he'd say, you know, go get a job. You know, your mom and I have struggled our lives to, to have this small business, and we're going to run it the way we want to run it. And you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, Dad, but here's the numbers. They don't lie. We'd have a number of arguments back and forth. He'd throw me out of the store, say, go home, go find a job. I'd go pout for a week or two. My mom would make peace with my dad. I'd go back to the store. He'd throw me out. And I just, and, and as I look back at it and didn't see it at the time, it was a classic father-son kind of argument about merit and manhood or value. And I was going I decided quite subconsciously that I was going to prove to my dad that I had real worth and I could do something. But the only language he understood was the business he was in. And so I thought his business was wrong. I'm going to do one that's right. And I invented one in my mind and began playing with it and making sketches of stores and fixtures and thinking about things that I might sell. And I had a spinster aunt and uh, I don't think she knew what was going on in terms of what I was imagining. She just knew that my dad and I were, weren't getting along and I didn't have a job. And uh, my aunt Ida said, I've, I've got uh, $5,000, which was her whole net worth, spinster aunt. And she said, I'll give you the $5,000, but you have to put it in the bank and promise not to spend it. But banks will loan money to people that have money, I think. And she said, so if I give you the 5000 you put it in a savings account, and you have to promise never to spend it because that's all I have. And my parents couldn't have contributed. They, didn't, they had nil. And so I did, waited a couple of months and went to the neighborhood bank and I said, by the way, I'm thinking about starting a business. And the, the loan officer at the branch said, well, how much money do you have? And I said, well, I've got $5,000 in your bank. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't know, but I've got $5,000. Would you make me a loan? And he says, well, if you have $5,000, i will loan you ten. But why don't you come up with an idea? I said, oh. the limited, because I had limited assets. <laughs> it, 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 people thought it was a terrible name. They said, it sounds like a train, and when is the limited leaving town? And I said, no, no, it's a, it's, it describes the assortment, and it's a romantic name. I was so positive the first store would work, 
that a shopping center was announced in Columbus, the first shopping center. And uh, I signed up for a store in that shopping center. So I had I leased the second store before the first store had opened. And uh, so at that point, I had a negative net worth of $5,000, and I was looking down about a million dollars. Here you have two stores, you know, they happen in, in sequence. What's the total lease liability? What is it going to cost to finance an inventory? How many people would work in the store? And, you know, incidental expenses like lighting and plumbing, you know, taxes. I knew that when I'd committed for those two stores, and the first one hadn't opened, that I was looking down the throat of a million dollars. I didn't know anything, but so first I wanted to be just curious about how deep the pond I was getting into. I said, oh my God, uh, this is a million dollars and I've got, I've levered the 5,000 I've bought from, I borrowed from Aunt Ida. Um, I said, well, maybe I could do and dollars in business. Maybe I could get terms. I could actually sell the merchandise before I had to pay for it. You know, a lot of uh, optimistic guesses uh, of what, how it might work, and it worked a little bit better than I thought. The store was successful, and by the time I was 30 years old, I was several times a millionaire. And I, and I knew it, but I can remember, this is an example, it wasn't very important to me. And I remember saying to my, my administrative assistant, do I have any money? And she says, why do you ask? And I said, because I want to buy a car. And she says, well, of course you have money. I'm, you know, how much do you want to spend on a car? And I, maybe I said it was $3,000. So yeah, no question. You, you could afford that. So it, how I kept score was the growth of the business, but it wasn't about uh, uh, score in terms of how much money I was making. I felt good about what I was doing. I knew I was employing people. I was growing the business. It was just tons of fun. So it, uh, I, I would, I think it was probably analogous to how an athlete would feel that just enjoys the sport, and the fact that you can you get paid. I think Tiger Woods loves playing golf and he loves winning, and the fact that he got paid just made it all the better. I think the the retail game. I tell my kids this. I tell people that I'm recruiting. It's just wonderful because it's all about people. <laughs> And, uh, and, it's, and, and if you like accounting, you can do accounting. If you want to do money in banking, you can do money in banking. There's a tasteful part that comes in the selection of merchandise, store design, systems design. So everything, uh, all, all aspects of business come together in retailing. And it's really tough because it's relentless. It's, we're not building jet engines. We're guessing what young women are going to want to buy next week and three months from now. And so the, the fickle, fickle fashion, the challenge of it is you have to be in the game every day because it's changing. We don't have a, a book of orders like GE does making jet engines. They design a new one every decade and the order book lasts for three years and they're managing to it. I knew the young women I knew and I knew what kind of clothes they bought so I thought I would just buy clothes like I thought they would, they would buy and then they did. Now, as I got older, you know, still focusing on young, young women, I had to pay attention to what young women were buying and, and make guesses about what they would do. But I think the, uh, the question about purpose, I get back to that, is to say, okay, you made a million dollars, or you've made 10 million, or maybe you could make 100 million. And I'd say, well, why? I'm just, I, I got, I'm running this business, I started this business, it's a ton of fun. Tons of fun for me, you know, I, I really love what I do, and I'm kind of racking up a financial score, and it's kind of, but why? It kind of backed into it. Uh, I opened a store and it was successful, and I said if I had, you know, one, probably could have two in a city. And so if two in a city, you could have three. And they said, well, could you grow, how many stores could you have? Well, if you could only have let's say the size of the, uh, the market, the city of Columbus, I could have four stores. So I said, but if you went to two cities, you could have eight stores. So I mean, that's, that was the, the, the kind of the amateur, the 27-year-old or 26-year-old talking to himself. And I'd say, well, but p people didn't have stores in multiple cities. Uh, 
department stores were locally owned, specialty stores were locally owned. There were no regional or national businesses. So I thought, well, when we lived in Chicago, my dad would commute an hour from the north side to the south side to work every day. So it was an hour going and an hour coming. And I said, geez, I could open a store in Dayton. It's an hour to Dayton and an hour back. So if I, if, and Dayton is kind of like Columbus. So if I lived in Chicago, I'd be commuting. So I'll just commute to Dayton. So that was the idea. And I told my dad I was going to do that. And he said, you, the merchants in Dayton will eat you alive. You've been, you're lucky to be successful in Columbus. I said, well, I think it's the same. And if the story doesn't work, I could afford one failure. And it worked. The idea of leverage is like, you know, if I had one story, I opened two. You know, you have two stores, you have two, you could get how you could get to four. If you had four, could you get to eight? And so I was just playing, it was just like scribbling on a napkin and saying, gee, was, this, is, this is pretty interesting. But how do you get from one community, Columbus, if I'm going to get to a larger number of stores, I'd have to be in multiple cities. And everybody knew that people didn't have stores in multiple cities. And I said, well, you know, I could try it. Uh, maybe didn't see it was leverage, but it was a way to get to scale. But I recognized, but probably intuitively couldn't articulate it. We had a, a merchandise plan, we had a store design, we had a name of our store, we had a lot of things that were replicable. And so if, if I could open a store and then I could open another one just like it, and then you could open another one in another city just like it, uh, put it, calling it leverage. You have a replicable model that's repeatable, and there's also financial leverage and, and human scale. So I recognize if I had four stores, then I'd probably have four assistant managers. Uh, those four assistant managers have career opportunities to become store managers if I open more stores. You know, if I'm picking a style for one store or a color, a garment, why couldn't I pick the same style for eight or 10 stores? You're just writing a bigger number. So what I try to uh, do is say, what is what I'm doing? Could I copy it? I really didn't see it as leverage, but I said, I can just build, uh, it's like McDonald's building a gold, more golden arches. You know, uh, I, said, I could open more stores and I could try them in different cities. And it kept expanding. So. Columbus and Dayton, then Columbus. And I said, well, Dayton is an hour away to drive and Milwaukee is an hour away to fly. But I remember thinking that what's the difference between driving an hour to Dayton or flying an hour to Milwaukee? Is time and distance the same? And I got a map and I said, you know, it's far away, but the, 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 uh, the characteristics of Milwaukee, Columbus, Dayton are similar. So they say, wow, that does work. You could actually open stores in Milwaukee. And then I went to the, an office supply store, got a map of the U.S., and got a compass and a, and a wax crayon, and I drew concentric circles out 200, 300, 400 miles out of Columbus. And I said, my God. When I started the business, they said, you know, what could, what could I do? And I said, I don't know very much. And so... Uh, probably heard this probably when I was in college, Special, specialization was very popular. Uh, friends that were going to be doctors weren't going to be doctors, they were going to be dermatologists, they were going to be cardiologists, no one was just going to be a doctor. So I, I was probably influenced by that and said, well, I can't compete with all these other guys because they have more resource and they know a lot. So. What if I, if I know a lot about a little, maybe I could find my way. So that idea of being a specialist, you know, businesses that are focused on young women and clothing and what they wear and, you know, really knowing that customer and being very focused. Is that now I don't have to compete with all the resources that, let's say, a department store has. I'm just competing with one merchant. The funny story I like telling, I was driving to Dayton to visit the store, and I was thinking about what other businesses I could start. So I said, well, I don't know anything about the shoe business. You know, half the people in the world are men, so maybe we could start a men's business. I'm a man, and I think men don't buy as much as women. And if, if our skill is in women and stores, do we and everything that women buy or wear, you know, Shoes weren't interesting. I didn't think much about accessories then. And I, and I remember saying that every, all the women I know wear underwear most of the time, 
all of the women I know would like to wear lingerie all of the time. And I'm just driving, driving down the highway, laughing my butt off and thinking what a funny thought that is. And I'm driving back from Dayton, I'm, I'm laughing more to myself. What, what does that mean? Uh, geez, uh, what's the difference between lingerie and underwear? Or lingerie is emotional content. You know, men wear underwear, women wear underwear, but lingerie is, you know. And so I said, I, I wonder why no one's done that. So I spent about two or three years as I was traveling around in Europe, Asia, uh, department stores, specialty stores, and I said, can't find a lingerie shop. In, in my mind, I said, there must be this wonderful lingerie shop in Paris, or maybe in Zurich, or maybe in Berlin, or maybe in Vienna, or just, they don't exist. And I said, wow. So I had this imagination that there's this wonderful lingerie store, except I can't find one in Paris. We open a store in San Francisco. I go, I'm there for the opening and pre-opening and design and setting up the store. And about a block away, there's a small lingerie store. And the ladies in the store said, you have to go see it. It's really kind of interesting. And I went down there and it was interesting. It was probably 800 square feet and it was uh, kind of Victorian. So it was like velvet sofas and it wasn't Victoria from England. It was American Victorian. So it was, you know, Tiffany lampshades kind of a place. But it was interesting and I just never had seen anything. And I called the owner up, found out who the owner was. And I called him, I said, gee, next time I'm in San Francisco, I'd like to meet you. And he said, well, what do you do? And I told him, I had the store down the street. And he said, oh, I, I don't know, I don't want to meet you because if I, uh, you, you just want to understand my secrets. And uh, you know, you, you'd probably want to start a business and put me out of business. I said, no, I'm just curious, which I was. and. Uh, about a year later, I get a phone call. The guy says, this is Roy Raymond. Remember, we had the phone conversation. I said, oh, yeah. And he said, uh, "Are you still? In, would you be interested in buying my business? So it was his idea, not mine. And I said, well, I don't know. I just, I didn't, you know, been thinking about lingerie business, but haven't done anything. We're very busy doing things. And uh, he said, well, uh, if you want to buy it, uh, you could buy it but you have to come right away. And I said, well, maybe I'll be out in a week or two. He said, no, I'm, I'm, the sheriff's gonna shut me down tomorrow. So if you wanna buy the business, you gotta come out right now. So I said, okay, and I just went out and met him. First time I met him, he told me about his business. He'd started it as a, a master's uh, 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 project, the way, uh, not, not unlike the way Fred Smith started Federal Express, and he was going broke. And I said, if you wanna buy the business, you know, here's what I have, and if you, we can come to agreement, I'll call the sheriff and tell him not to shut me down. But we know how to run stores, and he had had no experience. He just, this was a, a, a 3D, real-life model of what he had written about in his master's uh, uh, project when he was at Stanford. And I said, it makes sense that, you know, people buy lingerie, I didn't know what the margin was, I didn't know anything about it, didn't know about fits, constructions, all this stuff. I said, I'll, I'd figure it out. And so they bought the business, and we were a public company. So I called our board and I said, well, I bought this business. And uh, the response was, well, everybody can have a toy. <laughs> so, you know, if this, if this is something you want to play with, it's okay, but it could never be a business. So that, that was... Um, kind of daunting and we were very busy with other businesses so just Ray you know Roy rather we won't bother you you know we'll, we'll here, here's some cash so you can pay your bills just run the business and you know we'll talk every three months I didn't didn't wasn't much engaged but the real risky businesses we bought you can grow a business by starting a business starting other businesses you could buy a smaller business or you could acquire a larger business and uh, one Friday morning, I was looking at the Wall Street Journal and it said the management of a company called Lane Bryant uh, was going to buy the company. And I thought, gee, this is kind of interesting. If, if it's a public company and the people that are running the company are gonna buy the company. And the article went on to say that there weren't, they, the company had tried to sell itself and there weren't any buyers. So the management of the company decided they were gonna buy it. <laughs> well. If that's a good deal for them, it might be a good deal for us. Um, got some public information, called the president of the company and said, well, we want to bid. And he said, well, you have to, you know, I'm running the company and I'm a bidder, so, you know, fry ice. Uh, 
and uh, anyway, called their lawyer, uh, who was uh, who was mentioned in the paper. And said, you know, the company lawyer he said, you know, we're we're real bidders, and uh, went to New York on a Friday afternoon. Got a little bit of information about how many stores and how much business they'd done. No financials. Uh, met with manufacturers Hanover Trust on a Saturday morning and arranged for a loan, bid on the company, and Monday night we owned it. <laughs> so I'd get home around three in the morning from New York, and we the net worth of the business was about our business was about one hundred and twenty million dollars. We borrowed one hundred and fifty million dollars from manufacturers Hanover to buy Lane Bryant. <laughs> the story was, I get home, you know, I'm back at my house in Columbus, I go in the refrigerator, it's three in the morning, pour myself a big glass of white wine, and I remember looking in the window and seeing my reflection and sipping the wine <laughs> and saying, you've just bet the ranch. Six months later, we'd paid off all the debt. I was working with good people. Uh, we thought we had good business practices. You know, we didn't think they had very good practices, whether it was sourcing, how they ran stores, even how they collected cash from their stores, how they paid bills. And just said, I, I, I just, I'll just bet that they're really screwed up. And, and if we put our practices on their business, good things will happen. Things begin and they, they peak and then they decline. So whether you look at life cycles of fashion, or you look life cycles of uh, uh, things that people buy, designs, everything is in a life cycle. And so looking at things and saying, okay, where is this in the life cycle? Is it the beginning? You know, is it the, the harvest time, or is this the part where it now becomes obsolete? Um, that thinking about the businesses that we've sold, it's like I, my, in, my instinct, my thought was, it was about time uh, in, a, in the life cycle and move on. So getting out of the apparel businesses and into beauty and lingerie, uh, those were very big bets, but they were very deliberately thought about and tested over time. I like to, to know about people. I know, like to, I'm curious about leadership. I'm curious about... Uh, biography and history and reading biography from a historical point of view and reading history to understand how people behaved. And one of the things that influenced the business was Emil Zola's book, A, a Lady's Paradise. And um, the notion of Victoria should be a lady's paradise. It's not, if men like it, if, if men like Victoria's Secret, that's kind of a bonus. But in my imagination, they should feel in, uncomfortable when they're in the store. That there's no mahogany paneling. There's nothing that's welcoming. This is a lady's paradise, and that's how we. That's that thinking goes into the design of the store, the fitting rooms, the fabric, the display. It's all from the, the lady's point of view. It's nothing to do with men. Every so often, somebody will say, "You know, if we had a men's corner. You know, we'll have some nice like Ralph Lauren wing chairs and a place for guys can feel comfortable when they're in the store." And I say, "No, it's this isn't. This is a lady's paradise." Probably it's the universal appeal of lingerie. Uh, I mean, we're selling the same things in Columbus, Ohio. At the same time, we're selling them on Bond Street in London, Fifth Avenue in New York, and uh, the Mall of the Emirates in Dubai, and in Hong Kong and in Shanghai. Is that the, the notion of sexuality, sensuality, how women feel about lingerie, uh, it's just, it's, it's a universal thing. Uh, it, it's just the, that's surprising to me, happily so. <laughs> I never thought I wanted to be a retailer at all uh, growing up. Uh, came from very modest circumstance. My father was born in Russia. My mother was the first child in her family born in the United States. No one had gone to college and everybody worked hard and uh, pretty much struggled. I think I went to eight or 10 different schools before, in different cities before I went to college. My dad's job moved him around, worked for different companies in different cities. And so I, I started working 
probably when I was nine or ten years old. Because if I wanted toys or jeans or whatever, I, there was no money in the family. So if I wanted stuff, you know, the way a kid thinks, I, I just knew I had to shovel snow or cut grass or, or do something. And so I, I look back at my career, I was always self-employed. I'd invent businesses or jobs. The first business that I, I think is interesting, I, was, I would do, you know, kids do babysitting. So let's say you're babysitting and you're getting paid 50 cents an hour or whatever I was getting paid then. And I figured out that if I could take 10 kids to the park on a Saturday, I could get 50 cents a kid for two hours. And so I could make $5 an hour or $10 for two hours. Babysitting one-on-one, -on -one, I'd only make a dollar for two hours. So I, I looked back and I said, I understood leverage. And then I was in high school, you know, looking for a summer job. I figured I could cut grass, because so I, 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 I had a lawnmower and, and I wanted a job. And then I figured out, people would say, what does it cost? And I, whatever the minimum wage was, say $3 an hour, I'd look at a law and I'd say, if I, can, if I thought I could c cut the lawn, in an hour, I'd say $3. If I thought it would take two hours, I'd take six. And uh, I just price. And then I figured out there was elasticity. I didn't have those words. And people would say, gee, that's not very expensive. So the next lawn that was the same size, I'd say $5. So uh, I think by the time I got to college, I was making two or $3,000 a summer when the minimum wage was 50 cents an hour, just cutting grass. And I, then I got a second lawnmower and hired someone, one of my friends, to push a lawnmower and did other things. Pretty quiet, uh, terrible student, uh, really wanted to be an adult. Just that I felt terribly constrained just by the family circumstance and uh, wanted to be successful, whatever that meant. I, it was you know, different. It's successful might have been when I was in high school, maybe one day I'd have a car. You know, when I got out of college, maybe one day I'd have a new car. Pretty modest goals. I've never been to a psychiatrist, probably should go see one. Uh, but I felt that I was just, I wanted to be an adult because I didn't like being a kid. I, I didn't think my parents really knew what they were doing. <laughs> you know, I knew they loved me and I, I loved my parents, but they, they weren't providing direction. And I knew if I was an adult, I could probably do better. And they didn't reinforce that, because my mom and dad would say, well, your dad's got a new job offer. What do you think he should do? You know, which house should we live in? And, and it wasn't being polite. They, they put uh, real adult judgments on me. And I can remember maybe the age of 10 or 11 going to bed and crying and say, they won't let me be a kid, and I can't be an adult. So they're giving me adult questions and adult problems to solve. And I'm a kid, so I gotta get, grow up as fast as possible. I had a younger sister, and uh, she really was a child. She still is. <laughs> uh, but I was the adult in the family from probably the time I was seven, seven, eight, ten years old, at least in my own mind. I have a son who's a senior in college, and he was an adult when he was six years old. My wife says, you must have been like that. You could tell him anything, he has good judgment. If you t said this is a secret, he'd never give it up. And he could do that, because that's just how God made him. My dad was really tough, um, loving but tough. So if he wasn't the kind of dad, uh, if I said I had a problem, he'd say, well, what do you think? And he'd make me produce the answer. Uh, I remember one time, uh, it started the business and I don't know, interest rates were very high and I owned the bank a lot of money. And my dad came over and he said, he said, I bet you're really worried. And I said, oh, no, I'm really worried. And he says, you're worried about the bank, you have all this debt. And I said, yeah, you're worried about the economy. You may not be able to you know, pay your bills. And I said, yeah. And he says, why don't you go home and go to bed, turn off the lights, pull, put a pillow over your head and really worry. And I said, dad, that's crazy. And he says, that's what, well, why are you worried? He said, let the banks worry, it's their money. You worry about the solution. You're just worrying about worry. I don't know that it was confidence. I, I, I've, I've, thought, I've thought that question, people have asked it. I think it was more, I was, it was fear of failure 
and I wanted to be successful, whatever that meant. Uh, I wanted to be independent. I remember I was dating somebody, uh, I was 23 or 25 years old, and they said, what's success? And I said, I don't know, making $15,000 a year, some point in my life, and having a new car every three years. Well, I think success, it's a, it's success is more about purpose, I think. It's, uh, you know, the people ask about success, uh, you know, as, at different points in your life. And as I look back, I think people that are successful feel good about what they are doing. And they f can look back at what they have done and they feel good about it. Uh, people sometimes ask about success and they say, well, what's your legacy? And I said, I think it's really a dumb question. I, th I think the question is, what am I doing now? And do I feel good about myself? Am I proud of myself? And I think it's, you know, whatever purpose there is in life, uh, I think success is about purpose. It's not about material things. I remember thinking and really struggling in my mid-30s and early 40s and just saying, you know, the, the, she must be a funny God that just makes people, you know, have financial fortune. You know, and it's like, what's the purpose of success? What does success mean? You know, is there, what is your purpose? And it's like, we can buy more stuff. You know, you could have one house, you could have two houses, uh, you could have a car, you could own two cars, four cars. You know, God must have a great sense of humor if you can make, you know, this kid from Columbus, Ohio, so successful. And I'm just racking up the store, the score, and I'm, and I'm doing well. And, and, and I'm, you know, I bought a ski house in Vail, I moved to Aspen, you know, I got myself a Mercedes, you know, the uh, toys, if you would, and things that I said, oh, as long as I'm working so hard, I ought to play hard too and, and, and enjoy the things of success. And I didn't feel rewarded. And um, I got to thinking about what would make me happy. And I thought, I didn't, I didn't describe it as purpose, I said, what would make me happy? And I said, you know, maybe I should try to make the world a better place. And played around with that idea. And I said, well, if I did that, could I, how would I do it? Do you, uh, uh, one of my acquaintances, uh, and who really had a great influence on my life, suggested that I sell the business and go to public life. John Glenn. One night in Vail, John Glenn sat me down and he said, you could retire. I was about 40 years old, and I said, yeah, John, I could. And he said, I want you to, and I want you to run for the Senate. I said, John, I'm a Republican. And he said, I know that. And he said, and I'm a Democrat. I said, yeah, and he said, but I want you to run for the Senate. He says, Ohio is pretty well split, half Democrats, half Republicans. You be the Republican, I'll be the Democrat. We'll do great things for Ohio. I said, John, I've, I've never run for public office. I wouldn't even know how. He said, I'll run your campaign. He says, you'll get elected. When a sitting Democratic senator named John Glenn, the astronaut, sponsors, you know, uh, a Republican, you'll get elected and we'll do great things. It just, it wasn't my calling. Uh, funny, about a year and a half ago, John, and John just passed away, but a year and a half ago, John and Annie Glenn came out, we're working on a project in Columbus, the National Veterans Memorial, and it's under construction, and John, now, by that time, he's in his early 90s, and comes in the office, and he said, you know, he says, driving out here with Annie, he said, we calculated that if you would have taken my advice way back then in Vail, you would have just been finishing your second term as president. I never aspired to that. So that the, the notion of, um, you know, finding something, which I was very lucky to find a career, which let me travel, you know, sourcing stores in other countries, uh, just uh, the opportunities of the career in design and uh, finance and all the things that make retailing interesting, my career interesting to me. So I started uh, looking at community responsibility. Maybe I should give of myself. It's a, re a really good question when you put it to yourself, what should you do? And so what I, th as I began to inventory my good fortune, maybe my skills and talent, I said, Geez, you're creative, you're a problem solver, you can organize people. Uh, people would say to, to me, "Less, you're a leader. And I'd say, when I look in the mirror, I don't see a leader, I just see the founder. I got here first and I was lucky. 
but I'm not really a leader. And they said, no, you're, you're really a very good leader. So I, I thought about this. Now, this is thinking over about a five-year period. I'd say, well, if I'm a leader, I just want to see if, if test the credit that people are giving me. People are saying that I'm a leader, but I don't feel like one. So if I was really a leader, if uh, I took a job in the community uh, with United Way, uh, with my synagogue, uh, uh, took a responsibility at the university, something outside of business, could I apply the same kind of organizational skills? That's how I described it, leadership skills, sequence things and creativity that presumably that I have in my business. Are these skills transferable? And even though people are saying you are a leader, I said, I'm not a leader. And uh, so in this process, one of the things I began doing is reading books about leadership. Uh, and so from then till now, period of 30, 40 years, I'm probably pretty well read on the, center, on the subject of leadership. George Washington came from very modest circumstance. He, he wasn't the son of a plantation owner. He was the son of a farmer whose farm happened to be near a plantation. He had no formal education. Very frustrated, he started writing a diary when he was in his, uh, in his teens. And he, he wrote things like, when I grow up, I want to be respected. When I grow up, I want to be successful. When I grow up, I want to know things. Uh, he never had the opportunity to go to college, probably was homeschooled. What I find fascinating about Washington is he wanted to make something of himself. And the, uh, to his imagination, when he's in his early 20s, being an English gentleman was kind of the standard in America. Obviously, the country hadn't been founded, and most English gentlemen were officers. And so he goes to the, the governor of Virginia and, and, and volunteers to become a British officer. And they, they, essentially, the governor throws him out of his office and says, you know, go, go do something in the militia. You're not an English officer. And uh, he, he keeps his, his day job as a surveyor, and uh, earning his living, kind of helping his brother run the farm. Uh, and he starts following things, and you know, the, Eng the English general is going on a, you know, an excursion into the West. Can I tag along? I want to see what you do. And then, then as he progresses, you know, he wants to be uh, well-regarded in his own community. So he runs for some kind of public office, what he really wants to do is be a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. And he gets that. But he read it and said, boy, there, there's somebody like me. Now, I didn't grow up on a farm, uh, but he grew up in modest circumstance. And I have ambition, and he had ambition. And so at some point, when you, you're uh, full of ambition, you feel very guilty. Because you're, you're escaping a little bit of your friends. Uh, maybe you're, the circumstance, the, the farm you grew up in, you know, you, you, you know, your, your, your friends, your, your, uh, your playmates growing up are farmers' children. And now you're, you aspire to be in the House of Burgesses, and you're with the aristocrats. John Glenn is my friend, and uh, people are inviting me to be on the board of the Whitney Museum, you know, uh, the American Ballet Theater. Uh, the university's inviting me to you know, had their endowment campaign. And I, I can't believe that people are seeing me in this light. And my friends are saying, well, you know, why are you doing these things? You know, like, as if no one's asking us. And I, and I think uh, I had a very difficult period. A man named John Galbraith from Columbus was a very successful international real estate developer. And I called him up, didn't know him, went down to his office. And uh, I said, I don't want any money. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes. You were raised on a farm in Mount Sterling, Ohio. And you, know, you went to college, but kind of couldn't afford it during the Great Depression. And then as a mature man, you're doing real estate developments all over the world. You own the Pittsburgh Pirates. You own Kentucky Derby winners. Uh, you have a, on your farm outside of Columbus, you have your own airport, the Queen of England flies because you're a horse breeder and you're in this society. How does this happen? How do you go from Mount Sterling, Ohio, 
to the Queen of England's your friend. And he says, just pursue the things that interest you and you know, you'll, you'll meet some dead, uh, go down blind alleys, some things that you think will interest you, will bore you, but just you're a curious person, pursue the things, don't prejudge them. And I said, but you know, I'm having a difficult time with my friends because I'm going to Hong Kong, I'm going to Europe, I'm doing all these things and I'm not like them anymore. And he said, I'm not like my boyhood friends either. But, you know, I go back to Mount Sterling once or twice a year and, you know, sit and have a cup of coffee or a beer with my high school buddies. And I can't tell them about the Queen of England and winning the Kentucky Derby, but they're still my friends. And he said, so you, 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 never, you never want to leave your friends behind. You never want to leave your past behind. But don't let that keep you from exploring the possibilities that you have. I think you're always finding the way is the hardest part. Uh, at every stage of life, every trial, every success, uh, you know, you're, you're going into uh, some kind of fog. There isn't a, a plan that suddenly reveals itself and you go, ta-da, oh, now I understand. So I was in my mid-50s and I fell in love. I was you know, single for, for, for most of my life. And uh, you know, best thing that happened to me is my wife. Uh, and got four kids, all of them go to Harvard, <laughs> much better than their dad, uh, and they're really bright kids. Uh, so, you know, they, now how does, how does a wife and, and a young family fit into a career and things that you're doing? And I, I think uh, I, I'm, uh, the way I self-describe it, I have terminal curiosity. And so I, I, I always think that the future will be better and different than the past. And I'm, uh, I think uh, as I look back and take inventory of myself, I'm very open-minded and flexible. So people say the older you get, you get set in your ways. I don't think so. You have to keep being curious. The, the notion that um, the present is different than the past and the future will be different than the present. And the present is past as we say it. it so you know, I, I think I'm always, a, I, by nature, I'm an optimist. Maybe I was driven to escape from my child and, and to be something, maybe create my own world or career the way I wanted it to be. And I keep doing that in, in just very interesting ways. So, so I think the, the, maybe the, the nub of it is uh, I started the business and I think uh, maybe I was 30 years old and one of my business professors from Ohio State, Arthur Coleman, he said, he said, you know, you should do is plan to redecorate your office every five years. And he says, because you have to plan to change and you have to change your environment. You have to find different stimulation because if not, mental skills are like physical skills. If you don't exercise, if you don't stretch, you become inf inflexible. And he said, what you're going to do is keep that mental flexibility. And that was really a big idea. Uh, saying I'm above my desk, as I found it's a Einstein quote, I'm still learning. And at that time when I was struggling with being successful in a financial way, and people would say, you should be very happy, look how well you're doing financially, and I couldn't, I was struggling to find purpose, if you would. There's another quote from, uh, from Einstein that said, happiness and well-being are the ambitions of a pig. And I, and I thought, boy, that's exactly how I feel. My friends don't understand, like, whether it's belonging to a country club or playing golf or you know, whatever vacation is, that should make you happy. And it's like, no, those are, that, that happiness is, is, is much deeper. And, and I think people have to struggle to find things that give them purpose, that real meaning. Why am I alive? Why, 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 why did God bless me with these skills or these resources? What am I to do with them? If, if God just lets some person be very fortunate, let's say financially, it's, it's kind of a funny God. I think um, God helps those that help. Kind of my grandmother saying, uh, and you know, uh, I, I began thinking in the same crucible period, maybe in my 40s, uh, which is another story. I was in Aspen, I'd go out, I was in Vail rather, I'd go out in the summer for like boot camp by myself to think and read. And it was always a struggle because I enjoyed the exercise, I enjoyed getting away from work and just being by myself in that, that 
atmosphere. I like looking at the mountains and thinking big thoughts. And uh, happenstance, I decided one summer that I'd climb Vail Mountain. That's not a technical climb, but you're going from about 7,500 feet to 11,500. It's a, it's a good walk. So um, I got in shape for it by jogging, you know, a mile, two miles, five miles. By the end of uh, two weeks, I was in pretty good shape to jog. I don't know, I think it was about 10 or 15 miles. So I drove to town, parked my Jeep, and just walked up the damn mountain. And uh, uh, along the way, a big thunderstorm came up, and I didn't want to go back because I was about two-thirds up the mountain, and I was never in danger. So it was some thunder, some lightning. and, and But I said, I, I had this objective. I'm going to climb the mountain. I get to the top, and as I remember it so vividly, stopping on the, st standing on the top of Vail Mountain, and I'm looking on one side, and it's dark and cloudy and the rumble of the thunder. And the other direction, it's just blue skies and sunshine. And I think, well, I've got to remember this. And I start walking down the hill. And... Um, I said to myself, well, what if I'd been, what if I'd slipped and fell? Because, you know, I could have broken a leg, I could have broken an arm, I, no one knew I was there, you know, it's, it, it wasn't a traffic place, uh, I could have had hypothermia, I could have died, I could have been hit by lightning, and, and all this stuff. And so I'm thinking that, and then I'm thinking, okay, but when you get to the bottom, you got to get yourself a treat. Is it an ice cream cone, or do you have a beer? And, and uh, I said, gee, was... Uh, I could have killed myself. I didn't take any water. I didn't take a jacket. I was really naive about being in that kind of uh, geography, uh, completely unprepared. And so then I should taking a bottle of water or, or telling somebody where I was. Nobody even knew that I went out into kind of the wilderness. And I said, I wonder what, if I had died, what would have happened? And I said, this would really be a catastrophe for my mom. My dad had just passed away. She depended on me. This would really be tough. And then I got to thinking, what would people say about you when you're gone? Which is really, uh, to me, was a, a very important question. And I thought about that for a couple of years and said, what people say about you when you're gone doesn't matter. You're gone. What really matters is what do you say about yourself in the here and now? Are you proud of what you're doing? And if you, know, if, if, if you had a short lease and it ended today or it ends tomorrow, what would you wish you would have done? Because you better do it because you, know, you could fall out of the sky, uh, you could have an illness, you could have an accident. And uh, then it was at least five years of looking for purpose. I think I'm obviously most proud of my family. Uh, I like my work. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, the thought that I should tithe in time and money. And so I made a, out of this challenge that I put to myself about feeling proud about myself, I said, you know, let, let's, let's make a five-year plan financially of how you think you're going to do. And this is, I'm 40 years old. And... I want to give away 10% of my pre-tax income every year and some share of net worth. And I say, that would make me feel good about myself. And I want to, if I'm capable and I'm a leader and I'm organized and the nice things that people say about me, then I should be efficient with my time and I might be lucky in that I can make more money, but no one can make more time. So... The discussion I had with myself was, you're working 70 or 80 hours a week. So say it's 80. And, if, and so if you're going to tithe in time, you're going to spend eight hours a week, 400 hours, 500 hours a year on something that's important outside of yourself. So you're going to give money and you're going to give time. And if you're going to give 500 hours a year to something, over a decade, decade you're going to spend 5,000 hours. So what do you pick? I pick my religious community, the city of Columbus and alma mater. You know, I think that the notion of there's, there's this greater force outside of our, ourselves that, uh, that's created the universe, creates challenges, creates opportunity. Uh, 
the notion of man's responsibility to man. I mean, I'm particularly unhappy with the president. I don't like his behavior, and I'm a Republican, and I don't like his policies because they're almost the antithesis of the American character, of generosity, of charity, of welcoming, of helping, of taking risks. Uh, you know, you think of the lives that were expended in World War I and World War II to help others and say, now we'll drop the bridge and we'll protect ourselves. We won't have a broader role in humanity. My dad never said much. You know, he'd, he'd smile and he'd say, you know, you're doing a good job. Or, you know, tell me how business is. It was pretty superficial stuff. And I came back from a trip to Hong Kong and uh, flew to um, uh, Florida. They had a, by then, a little apartment in Hallandale. And uh, I think I slept about 18 hours because I was just really, I remember being very tired. And when I woke up, he was like all dressed and waiting for me. He said, we have to go for a walk. And uh, one of those walks along the ocean. And we talked about nothing, the trip, my trip, what I'd done, how business was. And then uh, on the way back, he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, I, I, I'm very realistic about my age, my father said to me. And... Uh, in my own health. And he said, uh, so he says, I'm, I want you to know that I've lived the proverbial three score and 10, so I've won. And he says, so I'm, I'm very happy. And he says, all the rest is gravy. And he says, that's just how I feel about things. He said, but uh, your mom, you think is very strong and you really don't understand. She really needs you because she's really needed me. And he says, she's, she just, you have a responsibility so when I'm gone, don't worry about me. I'll be in another place, and I'm not sorry about it, but you have a real responsibility. So I said, Dad, come on, you're talking nonsense. And he said, he said, you have a lot of ability, much more than I ever thought you had. And he said, um, what I'm worried about you is you're optimistic. And he said, and you, th you think the world is full of goodness. And he said, I, I just want you to be careful because you know, you'll have adversity. And he says, you've been so lucky and so blessed. He said, but, you know, you really have to think about things. Uh, and I hope you, you know, you, you beat the odds and get the three score and 10. Uh, but you really have to think about how the disappointments that people can have. And he says, you're, you're kind of like Lochinvar, you know, you're, you're just optimistic and naive. And, and I, I think he was right. I, to a degree, I like that, that, that. Uh, you know, the notion that you can make the world a better place. He said, you know, you've made a big success of the business. He says, the business will grow tenfold more. He says, way beyond what you're imagining now. He says, you have real ability. And he says, I, I, very few people have. And he said, it went further. He said, I, as I'm telling you the story I'm remembering, he said, I've worked with a lot of young people and see young people. And he said, uh, you're, as you're developing and maturing, you're actually developing and maturing more and more capacity. And he said, I've never seen that with anybody I've trained. And he said, I'm really surprised that you're, you're just keep to, you're kind of blossoming in, in ways that, he said, I, are surprising to me. And he said, it's very unusual. You have to realize that about yourself. You have more ability than I thought you have. You have more ability than you think you have. Well, it was very emotional because it, it, in a way, it's kind of a scene from a movie of a father and son walking on the beach and the father saying, I'm not going to be here, so this is what I want you to know. And uh, so I think at the, in real time, I, I didn't really absorb what he was saying. You know, and after, after my dad was gone, I said, I wonder why he did that, because it was so deliberate. Obviously, he had time to think about it. I think part of it was he wanted me to know that he was proud of me. Uh, I think he wanted me to make sure that I understood my responsibilities to my mom. I think he also wanted me to think about the ability, what I would describe as good fortune, because I just I'm really a lucky donkey. And my, and my dad said, hey, you have real ability, and just be careful how you use it. Well, I think he'd, he'd laugh. He'd think it would be pretty funny. Uh, uh, but I think you really appreciate it. Uh, I think it's it just, you know, pre he, he, once he, he'd know for sure that I, I really appreciated him. 
and a uh, major force in my life. Because that, that notion of, I think there's some, some people you coach by telling them the answers. And I think there's other people that you coach better by asking them questions. And he was that kind of coach. So when I said he was tough, he didn't tell me answers. He'd say, well, you could do it this way or you could do it that. This could happen or that could happen. What do you think? And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, well, you better think about it. My mom was terrific. She, um, I, I, I described my mom once, if fear was a color, she was colorblind. Nothing frightened her. If, if I told her that I was going to, you know, to take over General Motors, she said, well, you could do it. I mean, just the most preposterous things, ambitious things, said, you could do it. You know, I'm, I'm not easily daunted. Scale, my wife observes, which is a, a very, uh, a very important thing, because she knows me better than anyone. She says, it's funny, you have no trouble with scale. You can imagine things, and the size doesn't daunt you. So, like New Albany, the community, say, I think I'm going to plan a city. This would be a fun project, and it's going to be 12,000 acres. Let's just start planning it. And she said, that's, you know, that's just really unusual. Or, you know, you, you plan a business to double or whatever it is you're planning. She says, if you imagine it, and it's fun for you to imagine and you start playing with it, then you'll engage, and the scale doesn't daunt you. The flip side, and her insight to me is helpful to me, because I think she, um, she sees me better than I see myself. Uh, she says, you have to, she says like, sometimes you'll say things, and it, there's a risk implied in the scale of what you're doing or what you're attempting. She says, but like, you have an enormously uh, active risk calculator and you think about things for a long time before they kind of pop out. So people will say, that just, oh, we just had this idea. She said, I might know that you've been thinking about it for several years. I tried not to sleep because I was so, I thought you know, sleep is kind of a waste of time. So I tried to train myself to sleep three hours because I heard people could do this. So I'd say, okay, I require eight hours of sleep. So I'll set up a schedule for one week I'll sleep seven hours and 45 minutes, then I'll move it back to seven and a half, and I'll pick up all this time because there's all these things I want to do. I sleep eight hours. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I just, I, I just, I'm, I'm a very normal sleep cycle. But the interesting thing that Abigail would say, she says, she says, do you know that when you wake up, you'll say, I've been thinking? And I'll say, no. And she'll say, oh yeah, very common. She says, well, I don't know, you know, as, as we began to know each other, she says, it's really unusual. She said, do you know that you say that? And I said, no. She said, you process, uh, you know, your subconscious is working out things. And in the morning, you'll, you'll say you've been thinking. She'd ask, do you ever write things down in the night or in the morning? And I know. Well, you have to have good ideas, but you realize I said, you have to work. Uh, and if your work's fun, then it isn't like work. It's, it isn't like, boy, I'm tired, I've got to go home. It's like, I've, I've got to go home because I can't spend, you know, I've got other responsibilities. But I think the, uh, that leadership, uh, which is a subject in itself, so I think leaders lead themselves, but leaders have ideas, and maybe, maybe they're visionary ideas, you know, we probably today people would say, well, Steve Jobs was in a visionary because he invented this little gadget, uh, the cell phone. But he didn't invent cell phones and he didn't design the cell phone. He just took a couple of ideas and put them together. Uh, and no one else put those same ideas together as successfully as he did. But he, he had something that he was trying to do that intrigued him and he could do it very well. Our online business, we, you know, we started with a Victoria's Secret catalog, and, which is very successful. And that then became catalog mail order, became catalog phone order, then it became catalog uh, digital uh, entry of order, e-commerce. And so our e-commerce business is about uh, 20, 25% of the business, and it's the most profitable part. So the, the customer in the channel, whether it's store or how e-commerce markets the brand uh, or communicates or satisfies customer needs, the, the role of technology will change retailing. 
whether it changes it at its stores because stores are, can be more entertaining, whether you can provide different kinds of services, distance learning for store managers and sales associates. I think it, the, the, uh, what I talk about in the business is the greatest change in technology uh, that, that impacted retailing was the train. <laughs> Because people didn't, didn't have to just shop in their market village. They could actually get on a train and go to a big city. Goods could be distributed effect efficiently with trains. The two biggest changes, one was electricity because air conditioning. The retailing was very different in, in any kind of store experience, whether it was a restaurant or, or any kind of or a bookstore, was very different without air conditioning. So electricity and lighting and all the things that escalators, elevators, that made a big change in retail. Uh, mobile, the mobility, shopping center, people, people being able to have access to all kinds of things, if, if you would, in their neighborhood rather than the central bis business district was an important change. The notion of a specialist is that you, you the challenge is, can we be best in the world in a category? You know, whether it's, can Victoria know more about bras and, know, and uh, technically, uh, functionally, emotionally design characteristics? Can you be best in the world? And if you can be best in the world with globalization, you really can be best in the world. Like Starbucks, like McDonald's. So transportation, communication, not only transportation of goods and services, but the mobility of people cre has created what was, what when I began was everybody had a store in a city. Then people said, well, you could have stores in a region, you could have national business, you could have global businesses. My view is that everything begins with the customer. And, and if you know the customer, then you can match the merchandise and then you can market it. The marketing is, is kind of the icing. The, the foundation is the cake, that's the merchandise. And then the question is, do the customers, do they want cake or do they want cupcakes or donuts? What is it? And uh, so that the, 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 the intriguing thing to me is that as I get older and older, staying in touch with what society, young women want, and whether it's listening to music, going to movies, just watching people say, geez, I bet this would, this is a trend we should think about. This is something we should stop. You have to keep flexibility because the world changes and you have to change with it. Is that I really like change. So the, the notion that people will, you know, might wear thongs or might not wear thongs, or they might like lemon soap, or maybe they're gonna want orange, or uh, thinking about saying like, as whole foods and natural, healthy food is becoming more and more important, what does this mean to beauty products, natural ingredients? Because is what, is what people are putting in their bodies is important, and maybe it's what they're putting on their bodies important in cosmetics and beauty. So I, I look for patterns of behavior and, and opportunities to change the business. Two things about leadership. One, as I, people would say you're a leader, and I say, no, I'm not, I just got here first. And then I could, she said, what is a leader? I, I mean, it's like I started reading books about leaders and say, well, some leaders are tall and some leaders are short and some leaders are blonde and some are bald. And, you know, some are very good speakers and some are terrible. I mean, Thomas Jefferson had this little whispery voice and uh, Washington couldn't speak very well, so we went to theater because he, he, he saw actors as projecting themselves and, proje and to convincing characters. And so he equated that with leadership. So he would actually practice his speeches and was influenced by going to theater to know how to project himself as a leader. The foundation of leadership um, is your own moral compass. And so I think the best quality leaders really know where their moral compass is. They get it out when they are making decisions. It's their guide. Uh, people talk about not only do you have to have a moral compass and take it out of your pocket, but, but it has to have a true north. And in, in every culture, if there's a standard of behavior, if you would. Uh, people have it individually. Groups have 
cultures, moral, their own moral compass. What is right, what is wrong, what are the characteristics of what they do. When it comes to individual leaders, I, I had a thought, and I, I worked with Warren Bennis, and he wanted to write a book and I, with me. And uh, I told Warren it was bad for his brand, because I, I think he's the, the guru of, of the subject of leadership. And uh, he, he's, he, he didn't think so, but I, I'm happy that I didn't corrupt his brand. But the, the aspect of leadership that I find is most important is, and I think it's under-researched, is that leaders lead themselves effectively. And when you think, of, when you think about leadership, I, I try to teach it and coach it. Uh, myself and others. When you sell leadership, most people think about them. You know, it's like you're the leader, and, and how do you influence them? And clearly, leaders do take their followers, their flock, their enterprise, their business, whatever, hopefully to a better place. But I think the foundation of what makes really great leaders is they lead themselves, and they're conscious about knowing themselves and coaching and leading themselves. In a, in a very profound way. The simplest of us talk to ourselves. The question is, do we really lead ourselves? I think it's good to have your own selfish interests, whether it's liking chocolate ice cream or wanting a new car. It's just human nature is that. We, we have our own selfish interests. I think we have interests that go beyond ourselves to friends, to family first, maybe to friends, maybe to community. I think that's important to think about those spheres of influence that radiate from you. Then I think the question is, how important are these things? And, you know, if, if, if your lease was canceled tomorrow, what would you wish you would have done? What are the things you would like to impact and start on those? And, you know, you can change the world. If maybe you can only move, make your neighborhood a little bit better uh, or make someone's life a little bit better. There's some times where I thought, the, I bet the ranch and I lost the bet. Uh, pretty lonely moments. Uh, yeah, now I have a pretty good risk calculator. So if you, if you always, my, my dad said, if you always stand on the windowsill of a tall building, eventually you will fall off. So the, the notion is like, when are you, where's the edge? And, you know, but if you're going to get ahead, part of change is taking the risk to change, uh, recognizing that skills or point of views or ideas might be obsolete. Humans are pack animals, you know, so in biblical times and you know, the, the great market cities in Europe or the United States is that people want to be with other people. And in a way, the more that we're isolated, whether we're living on farms or only talking to our cell phone, the greater the need we have for group experience. And so, yeah, I think shopping goes in cycles where the stores are dull or maybe the marketplace isn't that interesting. But foundationally, just basically in human nature, we like to be with other people. So while people are saying that no one's going to go shopping because it's, it's just inconvenient and it's, it's not as easy as buying online, why are people going to concerts? Why are people going to museums? Why are they going to sporting events? I mean, why would you spend three or $5,000 for a ticket in the soup to go to a Super Bowl game when you can watch it at home for free? And, you know, and a beer won't even cost a dollar. And, you know, it, it, it just, or why do people go to restaurants between frozen food, food that's delivered, and microwave ovens? I mean, no one should ever go to a restaurant. The question is what the shopping environment will be like. Will it be more like Disneyland? Will there be big screens, TVs? When you go to a shopping center, will there be water slides or will there, will there be virtual reality? Uh, when you go to a shopping center, is it all fashion stores or is it health food stores, yoga, yoga parlors, and I don't know, uh, Whole Foods? It, I mean, if you look at shopping, uh, I read something interesting. We're talking about the great shopping streets in England in the 17th century. Was somebody figured out that calicos, that the kind of print and fabric which came from India, were colorful, but if you couldn't see them, you wouldn't know about it. So the idea of putting merchandise in a window so when people walked past your store, they could actually see things. Somebody invented that, and that changed shopping because people could actually go window shopping. It didn't exist. 
shopping, you went to a shop, an office, if you would. You know, it's like in the Western movies when you go to the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the general store and I need a dress and I need a pound of coffee and somebody goes in the back room and brings it out. It's like you know, the idea of display, shopping, self-service, all those were inventions. I think technology is going to aid retail uh, much more dramatically than technology is just you buy it online. I think what I've tried to do is make the world a better place. Uh, I think that's what's really important. No, nobody remembers who sold the most togas in Rome. I mean, in, in terms of legacy, people remember the great villains more than they remember the great heroes. And so I think how you feel about yourself, what do you say about yourself when you put your head on the pillow? Are you really proud of what you're doing and the way you're doing it? I think it's a really a fundamental question. So when I went through those formative years in my 20s and 30s, and I got to be 40, and everyone's saying, boy, you're a big success. And I'm saying, you're measuring it in like numbers of stores or income. And it's like, it, you know, I'm not Silas Marner. <laughs> you know, there's, there's more to it. And I think people, um, everybody has to solve that meaning of life and purpose question for themselves. Uh, so, you know, everybody does it their own way. I think you have to be thoughtful about the way that you're doing it. And, and so I describe it as purpose. If, if you leave a, if you can think about leaving a purposeful life, not just, an, not just accumulation, uh, but you actually make the world a better place, then I think in, in the grand scheme of the universe that that explains our existence. Uh, if not, we're just passing through, you know, we're grains of sand and we're, you know, we're blowing in the breeze. But I think different societies, cultures, individuals, teams of people make the world a better place. Uh, the founding fathers, they, they made New England, they made those 13 colonies. Uh, I don't know if they thought they were changing the world or just changing their world, but they did make the world a better place. And doctors and that, that cure patients or, or, or cure diseases or make discoveries, they're making the world a better place. And so, you know, can I make the world a better place by selling underpants? Not really. That's just the means, uh, the, the real, that, that gives me, uh, I don't know, resource to, to try to make the world a better place. I think the, uh, th that notion of making the world a better place, uh, could I have an impact? You know, this is you know, the, the questions that a 35 or a 40 year old ask. You know, if you're gonna impact things, could I impact America? John Glenn says, you can if you're a senator. I didn't think I could. Uh, and I admired what he did, but that's the purpose, what he found. I said, I think I could make my community a better place. The community was very good to me. Uh, you know, raised here, started the business here. It's, it's a pretty good place. Uh, so I felt an obligation to try to make my hometown a better place. You know, not much obligation to the state, but I... I'll put some effort there, but it was measurable uh, uh, and important to me. Alma mater was important to me, my religious community. And so those three things are kind of the areas. And I, I tell my children, I'm really lucky that I picked those areas because having worked them for 40 years, I'm really happy with the, I, that I picked those, those areas. And I'm also happy that I picked my wife and I'm happy that I, I picked the business I'm in. But the, the, the place where you put purpose, because if, if, uh, if time is time and, and uh, material resources, what, I mean, there's all kinds of demands on time. There's all kinds of committees and places, national, internationally. And I'd say, no, and every year, the, the staff say, okay, these are the areas. What am I doing? What have I done? Do I have a five-year plan? <laughs> you know, review the hindsight, the plan. Am I still happy in these areas? And I kept saying, yeah, this, these are really important things. I don't think we've in, I've invented anything. You know, Henry Ford really didn't invent the car, and Steve Jobs didn't invent the cell phone. Uh, 
in a, um, Shersel didn't invent uh, the digital revolution, but he could adapt, put things together in creative ways. And I, I can remember being in, in the UK and reading a London newspaper, and they were saying that Marks and Spencer sold, I don't know, 80 or 90% of all the lingerie and underwear sold to women in all of England. And then the remarkable thing was that women of all ages, the most popular garment, single garment they sold was the thong. And I was like, gee, that's really interesting you know, about English women, about that that could be it. So I go, so maybe we should sell thongs. And so the ladies that were running Victoria's Secret said, oh, that's really trashy. And I said, oh, let's try it and see. So I think in, in what we do, there's a lot of let, let's try it and sees. Uh, whether it's a new color or a new style, but we didn't we didn't invent cosmetics, we didn't invent lingerie. Uh, how we market them, uh, style, color, uh, those are the things that we do. But it, it isn't pure creation; it's um, putting together ideas. So I, I truly believe there's nothing really new in the world. What's sexy to some person might be trashy to somebody else, whether it's words or let alone, let alone lingerie. So the question is, where, how do you gauge that? And so what, what we try to do is watch movies, watch language, watch TV, you know, and see uh, what's in and out. So you know, we'll get all crazy about, let's say, watching the Academy Awards and say, boy, they're showing a lot of cleavage. You know, it's like, and this is on you know, network TV. What does that mean to us? Uh, when photographing, and I've never been on a photo shoot, by the way, for Victoria, but I always ask the people that run it, what are the supermodels saying? What do they wear? You know, what's, what's sexy to them? Um, so, and, and one example of a, just a simple commercial success would be uh, we, we would send samples of things that were either produced for the stores or lingerie we have in the stores, regularly the supermodels. So it's thank you and you know, it, it's just a nice thing. And uh, we sent them some bralettes. And within a week, they were, two or three of them, were at Coachella. And they wore the bralettes. And so from the time we sent them the garments, within a week, customers were coming in the store that had seen them on the internet and were asking about the Coachella bra. And there was no ad. But it was our supermodels wearing uh, bralettes and showing up in public and women seeing them and then coming to the store and they wanted to say, went with their phone saying, I want that bra. And, and say, okay, well, this must be a, a big thing. Well, I, th I think it's limited in terms of you know, doing a few things well. I think that's fundamental. What are, what are the core concepts of the business? And, how, and can you stay within those cores? And the limitless part is that how big can it be? But, it, but you, don't want to, you don't want to do a lot of things, you just want to do a few things, hopefully best in the world, and then how much opportunity does that give you? So if we could be the best in the world with the limited store that I opened in Columbus, Ohio, in that neighborhood, that was pretty good. And then if we could have the best store of its kind in Columbus and then Dayton and then in the Midwest and then the country, and now you can have a lingerie store that's the best in Columbus, but it also has global potential and global sales, that's the limitless part. I think I'm determined. Uh, and I think determ if you're determined, you're right. Your behavior is exactly the same when you're stubborn, except then you're wrong. <laughs> and so, I, you know, there's times when I'm wrong and I'd say, well, you were the dark side of, de of determined. But I, I think determination, you know, it's like have an idea, think about the idea, you know, the, the risks involved, what does it take to get from here to there? And then once you make the choice, you just, you just keep going. discussion with the kids was that it's the risk of leadership, personal risk. So if you say you're going to get A's and you don't get A's, you're going to be disappointed. 
it's, it's much easier to go to school and say, I'll just try hard and I'll get what I'll get. So, and everybody might not be an all-A student. Not everybody's going to be a great athlete. Not everybody's going to be a great dancer, whatever. But you know, what are the things that you're going to do? And you have to take the risks. And, and this was, you know, prepping that began probably when they were in third or fourth grade. Successful people, winners, do everything necessary to prepare to win without the certainty of winning. Everybody would take, would do everything necessary to prepare to win if winning was a certainty. And so you're willing to put yourself out publicly and privately say, I'm going to do this. And some of the things only you know that you didn't. And there's some things that you set out to do that only you know you did. And and some things your family, your friends, your community may know. But it, how, how you think about that, doing everything necessary to prepare to win, just to have the chance. And then how do you think about it? And I, I think um, we, we tried hard with, with our children to say, this is, you really got to process this. Uh, this isn't a silver platter situation. People that buy jeans want them to fit, and you want your shoes to fit. You know, obviously, uh, you know, how you want your figure to look and how it changes, and what you want your silhouette to be is, you know, is a pretty personal thing, and it's uh, probably a lot. And there's a lot of ego involved. So, you know, it's it's always as perfect as possible, and if it, if it's good, you'd like it to be better. So uh, everybody like to be more beautiful, you know, blonder, richer, all those kinds of things. So it's 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 kind of a nice thing.